and it's quite loud, so I'm gonna turn that up. So that should be better. Sound okay for you guys? If anybody can't hear me, please let me know. Okay, so I'm gonna get going. Uh, good afternoon. This session today is residential schools and ram ramifications for our students. Sorry, it's getting towards the end of December. I think we're all tired, I can't speak. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is brought to you by the Alberta Regional Professional Development Consortia, ARPDC, as well as funded through Learn Alberta. I belong to the um, ERLC, which is the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium, which is one of seven of the groups that belong to the consortium. I do a land acknowledgement before I get going. So Tanse, uh, I live on Treaty 7 land, which is the ancestral home of the Blackfoot people. There are also Diné here and Sutina and uh, Métis Nation Region 5, which I belong to, Region 6 as well here in Calgary. All have contributed to the shaping of Alberta and Canada. I thank the Blackfoot particularly for sharing this land with me that I live on. For those of you who haven't attended my sessions before, and I know many of you have, um, so just bear with me for a second, but um, just to explain my background and what informs me to be doing this work. Um, I am, well, there's my name, Tammy Johnson, um, and uh, through ARPDC, we're called Designers of Professional Learning, which means that not only do we offer these sessions online, uh, so the teachers have access more regularly and easily to PD, um, and it's mainly since the advent of um, COVID occurring and uh, many of the resources and things like that needing to go online and continuing that practice as teachers seem to really like that. But I also do go to uh, schools and school divisions and do face-to-face -face sessions as well as workshops, um, as well as we work on um, resources for curriculum and resources in general. Right now, the focus is on new curriculum for the elementary programs, which was just newly implemented in the last couple of years. I apologize if you hear barking, that would be my son's dog upstairs. I've done this two days in a row, I apologize. Hopefully you can't hear that as much as I can, it's distracting for me. Anyway, <laughs> um, and my job right now with the new curriculum is to show um, how First Nations, Métis, Inuit, Indigenous ways of knowing resources can be implemented within that structure, as well as um, there are many additions to the curriculum where it specifically asks teachers to use Indigenous ways of knowing. So that's part of what I do as well. And I also inform and work as a consultant with the RLC to help the core curriculum groups to uh, learn how to do this. So I actually next week will be presenting for the math group so that I can work with those teachers as well. Um, I am Red River Métis which is what Louis Riel called his people. Um, we were from the Red River Settlement. Uh, that is the political name that was given after uh, Lower and Upper Fort, um, up Lower, I was say Fort Gary because that's where I'm from. Um, Canada took over the um, prairie provinces, or became provinces uh, or, that were Rupert's land originally. And uh, our homeland was there before it was part of Canada. Um, so if you know anything about, think about Métis history, <laughs> if you want to look that up, um, things that necessarily were called rebellions and such were actually resistance against a government that was not in charge of our land yet. Um, if you know Indigenous people or you are Indigenous, you know, there's two questions we always ask each other. It's what's your name and where are you from? Basically, who are your people and where's your land? So I've already told you where my land is. It's actually north of Winnipeg, um, Selkirk, Manitoba. My family's from St. Andrews, Manitoba. And... Um, our main family surnames are Mowat, which is my mother's maiden name, McDonald, Mackay, and Beaudry. And the Mackays and Beaudrys are originally from this area in, in Alberta, and the Beaudrys from northern Alberta. My family did live in uh, Fort Edmonton and Fort Saskatchewan. They had land in both places. And that is actually a picture there of my great-grandpa, James Mowat, and the man that's sitting by the rocks there. There's a school in Fort Saskatchewan named after him, James Mowat Elementary, as well as a park right next to it, Mowat Park. And in Edmonton, there's James Mowat Trail, and that's with two T's, and that's named after him as well. And I say to people, well, the um, Scots were my grandpa's, the Mowats came from anyways, the McDonald's and the Mackays were actually from uh, just north of um, Inverness. But uh, Stromness, Orkney is um, just southwest of the Shetland Islands, if you know anything about Scottish history. 
Um, they're actually Norwegian settlements uh, and um, they spoke an, an archaic version of Norwegian with a Scottish accent. <laughs> so I always say, as much as I'd like to blame the English at the Hudson Bay Company, I kind of can't if they didn't understand them. It was actually spelled M-O-E-D, but still pronounced Moet. Um, my background is, uh, like I said, I came from Manitoba. I went to school in Winnipeg. I taught in the same school division, the Seven Oaks School Division, that I graduated from um, in the early 80s. And um, I worked initially with a lot of Indigenous students, particularly the girls that were there. And um, a lot of them had come off reserves at that time because of the economic conditions, which were much worse than they are now, even, if you can believe that. Um, and people were looking for work, and the kids were often shell-shocked by um, just the difference in the culture was totally different in the language and that sort of thing. And although I didn't understand the Cree language, my grandpa spoke Cree. Um, if you don't know, the Métis speak four languages, English, French, Cree, and Machif is Machif is the Cree language, or the, uh, rather, sorry, the Métis language, Machif, and we're called Machif people. Um, but many actually spoke Cree as well, especially the British Métis, which he did but didn't teach us, unfortunately. Um, but anyways, I did work with a lot of students that were mainly Cree back then. And then um, going into um, a couple of years ago, I started working on a project with Gataskanel Tribal Council and an online school, Ignite eLearning. I took their outreach program, grade seven to nine, and it's based on the season, so fall, winter, spring, um, decolonized it and added, um, in indigenize it for them, for their particular cultures or five different groups together that formed that um, education authority, as well as um, added land-based learning or what we call culture-based learning now and the Cree language, which I am thankfully learning now. I'm in my going to be in my fourth session in January with the Miss Gunwell here in Calgary. Um, yeah, so it, it really, as I worked on that project, it became very apparent to me that it came very naturally to me to work on this stuff and things that I grew up learning, um, just kind of by osmosis. Not, I don't think many people grow up necessarily going, this is what your culture does and this is what your culture is. Um, I think it's just part of who we are as people and we grew up with it. But then I also realized how difficult it was for me at some times because I'm not Cree, I'm Métis. And although I know quite a bit about the Cree culture because I had cousins that were also Cree. My great aunt Tassie, you see the picture, they're the four kids. My grandpa's the middle boy, they're Rosser. Um, his sister Tassie, my great aunt, married a gentleman who was uh, Cree. And so I have cousins that are also First Nations and a lot of people around me that I went to school with and grew up with were, but um, I mean, I'm not. So I didn't grow up with those teachings and those things that um, were very apparent and the protocols and things like that are very different. So I had to learn all those things. And I realized that that could be really tough for non-Indigenous teachers, particularly. I also realized that a lot of things that I learned growing up, particularly about um I knew politically about oh, everything Indigenous, um, especially growing up where I did in, in Manitoba, it's a very political place, whether it's First Nations or it's Métis. Um, I realized that a lot of people here, particularly in Alberta, don't know these things. And so it became really important to me as a Métis person and also just to advocate for Indigenous peoples, period, Indigenous students, our kids, um, to make sure that all kids are receiving the education that they should be in by and large, you know, obviously helping teachers to do that, um, helping you inform you guys helps with that. And um, yeah, that's what, that's what's important to me. So here I am, and this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing. All right, so um, I'm gonna just briefly show you the AIR PDC resources, because um, a lot of teachers don't seem to know these exist, and they are really important. They're um, all created by Alberta teachers, and, um, there are things you could really start with if you haven't got many Indigenous resources, and you may have even just accidentally by link came to resources on this page, or there's probably some in your school that are from here. Um, this website is referenced across Canada on post-secondary websites for education programs, particularly on library services that I've seen, and I've seen it referenced in the U.S. as well when I've been doing research, which I do a lot of. Um, I always tell teachers, if you have nothing else that you want to look at on here, because there's lots of stuff, start with the Orange Shirt Day and Beyond, um, particularly teaching tools. I see if you're looking for some posters for things like Sharing Circles or Orange Shirt Day or whatever you may have, they're in there and they're done by division as well. And they're nicely laid out, um, colorful, but not too much writing on them. And uh, they're principal for, yeah, they're by division, a lot of them. 
and there's resources there. Like there, you saw, there was a Francaise button as well. So if you're looking for French resources, they're, they're working on getting those all done in French as well. But I know it takes time. It's time consuming. Um, if you want just to look for First Nations, Métis, Inuit resources on the ARPDC uh, Professional Development Resources page, you look under focus, you can search there. When I just hit the First Nations, Métis, Inuit button, everything comes up, right? Um, but you can sort this by audience, or you can go by level for the kids, or you can go by types, depending on what you're lo looking for. So yeah, I just want to point that out because I think it's a really good place to start. They are all, like I said, they're paid for with our tax dollars by Alberta Teachers Forward, Alberta Teachers. So it's a really good place to start. All right, so there you go. I, I have, those are things that, um, you know, we're required to do, but I think are important to do as well for you guys so that you understand who's doing this work, who's who's um, in charge, who's presenting to you, right? And then what resources are available to you already that are right there for you guys. But now we'll get into the meats and bones of the presentation. Um, I wanna start first with a residential school's history. Um, I was reminded the other day, my daughter is actually, her partner is uh, a Métis man from uh, Edmonton. And so it was interesting. She was telling me the other day something about residential schools. And I was, cause I was having um, supper with her and I looked at her kind of funny. And I was like, I didn't think you remembered that. You know, because she goes, Mom, all you did was talk about these things when we were growing up. I homeschooled my kids until they went to high school. And even sometimes I helped her with some courses throughout high school. And um, I said to her, I'm surprised that you remember these things. I thought you didn't care. You were ignoring me. And she said, no, I was a kid. Of course, I didn't want to listen to you. But I did hear what you said. And she goes, and I remember everything. And and I realized actually how much I talk about these things to people. And just in casual conversation. And I have to remind myself sometimes stop talking about things that are political or whatever, um, you know, in certain situations. And not that it makes them uncomfortable, it's just always on my mind so that you guys know these things have always been important to me um, for people to understand. It's not just all of a sudden I've decided to do this kind of thing, but, um, you know, so I guess didn't realize how long I'd been actually talking about it. But I want to start here for you guys just to get this um, brief overview of the timeline of um, residential schools in Canada. For more than 200 years, religious orders run mission schools for Indigenous children, the precursors to the Government of Canada's residential school system. The Mohawk Institute becomes a boarding school. Run by the Anglican Church, it is the first government-funded residential school in Canada. A government report recommends Indigenous children be separated from their parents in order to assimilate them into Western culture. These recommendations influence federal laws and policies designed to strip Indigenous people of their culture and rights. Isla Cross opens in northern Saskatchewan. The majority of students are Métis. The government takes authority over Indigenous people and education for First Nations. The Indian Act gives the Canadian government control over Indigenous rights and culture. The act includes only First Nations as status Indians. It excludes Métis and Inuit. Prime Minister John A. Macdonald authorizes the creation of the residential school system, which is designed to isolate Indigenous children from their families and cut all ties to their cultures. The number of schools across Canada quickly climbs to over 40. The Government of Canada requires First Nations children aged 7 to 16 to attend residential school. Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce exposes the government's neglect of Indigenous children's health, including alarmingly high death rates of residential school students. More than 80 institutions are in operation across Canada, the most at any one time. Four students are investigated for arson. Others reportedly cheer as they watch the school burn. This is one of dozens of fires set by students across Canada as a form of resistance. Inuit children are officially included in the residential school system. Six schools open in the Western Arctic as the government takes over the administration of many church-run residential schools. Grolier Hall and Stringer Hall open in Inuvik, housing 500 students. 
More than 20,000 Indigenous children are taken from their families by government social workers and placed in foster care or adoption homes, often with non-Indigenous families. Adoptees lose connection with their Indigenous language, culture, and identity. 12-year-old Chani Wenjak dies after escaping from the Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School. A formal investigation follows. The all-white jury finds that residential schools cause tremendous emotional and psychological problems. The Canadian government takes over responsibility for the remaining schools from the churches. Thousands of Indigenous students are enrolled at the 28 residential schools that are still running in Canada. Bill Fontaine, head of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, speaks publicly of the abuse he suffered at Fort Alexander Indian Residential School. He calls for a public inquiry, which the federal government initiates in 1991. Gordon's Residential School is the last federally run school to close. The report recommends a public inquiry into the effects of residential schools, including language loss and trauma. The government provides compensation to survivors, including the common experience payments and a focus on funding and supporting Indigenous health and healing services. The agreement establishes funds for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the TRC. Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologizes to former students, their families and communities for Canada's role in the operation of residential schools. Provincial and territorial apologies follow in the years ahead. After hosting events across Canada, the TRC releases a summary of its findings. It includes 94 calls to action aimed at redressing the legacy of residential schools and assisting in the process of Canadian reconciliation. The new centre holds a permanent archive of materials and testimonies on residential schools gathered during the TRC. The TRC characterizes Canada's treatment of Indigenous people as cultural genocide. Thousands of children died due to Canada's residential school system. More than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy. Many people have said over the years, why can't you just get over it? And my answer has always been, why can't you always remember this? And until people show that they have learned from this, we will never forget. Yeah, so that's the timeline of um, obviously from the beginning of when this all started until, you know, most recently. And you can see that um, it wasn't that long ago that the last residential school was still in operation. There were still thousands of children being registered in 1979 for residential schools. I graduated high school in 1983. There were still schools in operation when I was in university. So it's it's not a far away thing um and it, and there's a lot of people that won't even talk about it um my grandpa we're not sure if he did or not um a lot of metis like you saw in Isle La Crosse particularly my actually my elders that I go to creek class with tonight they live there and his wife is Mitchiff from there and she went to residential school as well as he did and uh my grandfather um we wonder if he did because he had a lot of nightmares and things of um, things that happened to him and no explanation for it. We'll never know because he passed away um, without talking about it. But there's definitely some pretty severe ramifications for what did happen. Um, I do want to also add something positive because I know this is a grim subject, right? We all know it's a grim subject and I'm not going to shy away from the truths of it. Um, but at the same time, I want to talk about um, what we can do for our kids now, right? We want to make this a good thing. So I don't like to, I, I'm the kind of person in just even in my own healing journey, um, I practice Cree spirituality and um, I always try to focus on what I'm grateful for. Um, we know that there's even studies, right, from psychology that, because I have undergraduate psych degree too, that, you know, if you're grateful for things and you try to look at things in a more positive way, you're more likely to have a better life and to be successful. And I think it's also a very Indigenous thing to do is to try to look for the, the good. And I think something you can take away from this as well is consider that a whole 
group of people that have always lived here have gone through this as a group of people together, whether they've experienced it themselves with the ramifications of it within their families and their culture. And that governments and, and religious leaders tried to wipe out our cultures and it didn't happen. So we're a resilient people. Right? So I think that you can take that away from this, right? So to not feel, nobody wants anybody to feel sorry for them. They don't. We just want people to understand and to be able to use that empathy and, and understanding and compassion in, in the way that they treat people and how they deal with them. And I think that's, for me, that's what I want for our children. I don't want anybody to be going, oh, I feel sorry for you, because that's not what anybody wants to heal. So I want to show you this video too, just it's a really short, but it's it's amazing. It's these kids and they're talking, they're young and they're talking about, you know, their grandparents and their parents who went to residential schools and just, it's really short, it's a little news clip, but just how what they're doing to heal. And I think it's just amazing. It's that positive piece, right? It doesn't take too long to spool. I did have trouble with it one day, but it's so good. I don't want to miss it. No, it's coming up. <laughs> okay. Okay. There we go. Had me scared for a moment. Sorry, it took a bit there. And it's going to play an ad first, I think. Right. Sorry. This is a piece of string. Doesn't seem like much, unless it's a strand of mRNA. Then it has the power to change everything. mRNA has already changed how we fight viruses. It has created medicines at unprecedented speed. It could even individualize Sorry. how we- I do not endorse this app. <laughs> and the company that's getting us there? Moderna, this changes everything. All right, get the good stuff now. After more than a century of unforgettable trauma, Indigenous youth are now able to embrace their culture, something stripped from older generations who went to residential schools. I have a responsibility to have a voice for the other generations to come because I have to watch my grandmother heal from her time at residential school, and I just want to be a part of the generation that educates everyone else. Abigail Crow read a poem Monday night. With the children, what they didn't know is that they were lovingly embraced by the land. It was part of a vigil commemorating the 215 children found in unmarked graves near the site of a former residential school in Camp Luke, BC. She was one of many young people using their voice to express sorrow. Deanna Francis started dancing just three years ago. It's her way of connecting to her culture and healing. Francis's mother attended residential school. She can see those impacts on her upbringing. She never really hugged me growing up. She never really got hugged. She never was told I love you by her mom. Um, and that was just something that happened because of the residential school. Many of these traditions are passed on from older generations. <laughs> For these teens, the love of Indigenous music was shared by their grandfathers. That's who taught them how to hand drum. Horizon Anaquad says his grandfather's experiences were documented in a movie. It was painful to watch. It's like him being locked in, locked in a in a room in the priest's house for like a week, with like barely barely any food or something, and it was just like hard for me to see my my mom going through that. But the boys say they're committed to staying strong to continuing on their healing journey. I do this, I do it to heal for, for our next generation to come back stronger. So then Mama Shmoy says, Huck Muk means keep trying in our language. I think so. I guess I want them to hear that. That's all the good news. So I think that that's, you know, geez, 
see that those kids, they have a lot of joy, right? They, they are striving to have that better life and they want better than what their grandparents had. They, so I think it's important to understand that, right? And indigenous youth are very resilient kids and they, they really want to do better. So let's talk about that, right? So obviously those are the things, right? They, in that clip, they talk about that intergenerational trauma. Those things are passed down, right? Um, the loss of culture and pride, those things, those connections, right? That the government and, and the religious leaders tried to, to remove from indigenous culture. but we're learning those things, right? We have this re of, revitalization of languages like Garmala. I'm taking Cree for free, which is amazing. Um, you know, it's being funded and it, that's to me is, it's our last class tonight. And I guarantee you everybody in the class is gonna be crying whether they're actually, because there's people in there that aren't, you know, Cree speakers originally, their families, they, anybody can take the courses, but you know, there's a waiting list for, you know, but we all talk about the impact it had on us. And that's one thing we end up crying about it because it's so important to us um talk about health issues and things like that right the, the physical emotional psychological issues so if we talk about that a little bit right there's um and i'm not gonna watch another video we're done with videos but if there are links to some of these things on here as well if you want to watch but um this is bob joseph's website and he's a corporate trainer in um, ontario and he's the one who wrote 21 things you need to know about the indian act so if you ever had a chance to read that one i suggest you do um but this is on his website he has um, a corporate training group that works with um businesses and people that want to work with indigenous cultures through government or other corporations and um he talks about you know the implications and really the indian act is what started this right so that you saw in that video um and the indian act itself if you don't know is an illegal document because we were still under the british north america act even when canada became a country all of our laws our legal practice all of our precedent is set in english law and um we were uh, still under the royal proclamation from the 1700s that um i think was george ii possibly it can or the third, I think it was the second, um, had said that indigenous peoples of North America were to be left alone, to, to share the land with them, but leave them on their land, leave their cultures, leave them alone and let them do their thing. Um, but MacDonald ignored that. And that was partly due actually to Queen Victoria, because although we have this day that we celebrate her in May for her birthday, um, she wasn't doing it out of great um benevolence to release canada to its own country she no longer wanted to deal with canada because it was so large and it was so expensive and they had stripped all the resources at, at that time that they had wanted from here so they no longer wanted to deal with it anymore so basically she said to mcdonald when he wanted help um to deal with the west particularly where my people were the metis to um, to take over the land and to deal with what resources that he wanted and to, to get his railway through, um, she said, deal with the Indian problem first. And so that was part of it um, because, you know, she washed her hands of it, but if he wanted army and he wanted forces to be sent out and helped from England, that that's what he needed to do. So that was part of his issue to deal with it was to separate everybody from culture, right? So the ramifications of this with the Indian Act and, and the implementation of residential schools, then as you can see, there's this, these eight things that are here that he talks about ultimately. So today, the impacts of all of this, there's a higher rates of death in children and youth. And that obviously was the residential schools, but it's parents being separated from their children and their grandparents not knowing how to take care of their children anymore. You take away that ability. Um, illnesses and things that happen to children because of neglect right because of residential schools and then uh, like i said parents not necessarily knowing we're, we're reclaiming a lot of that but not knowing how to do that inadequate housing conditions occur like funding is not there for people we're talking particularly first nations right out of this because that's the indian act higher rates of suicide for many 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 reasons and right now on reserves especially since covid unfortunately that has climbed again and more in first nations people are dying of suicide than any other issues right now um lower levels of education fear from the educational system because of what happened in residential schools lower income levels because of all these things and then higher rates of unemployment when you have lower income levels and you have less access to ability plus racist policies or racist behavior from employers and then higher rates of incarceration which also leads to that higher rates of unemployment right and um, we have more indigenous people in jails in Canada than any other group of people and then obviously all of that leads to poorer health and this is not to say that every single 
First Nations, Métis, and Inuit person is suffering under these conditions. We're not saying that, right? I'm just saying, but these are particularly big issues for Indigenous peoples in Canada in general, right? So um, if you talk about that intertwining, it's hard to know, like I've said here, what, where one starts and another one ends. So how do you like dissect this, right? So it's a hard thing. So we're just gonna talk briefly um, about obviously these areas, right? So this loss of culture is, is really hard, right? And then for instance, like I'll take this idea and I, I just actually saw this, there was a man and I believe it was in this, I want to say in the States, I think it was Navajo. Yeah, because he was Navajo. I think it was in Arizona or New Mexico. I just saw this. It was on TikTok. It just kind of flashed across the screen when I was checking it today. Apparently, he went into the hospital for surgery for something and they cut off his braids. Like, this is just this week. And I was like, what? This sounded like something from the 1960s or 70s. I was like, what is happening here? So people are actually protesting there. Like they're, they're out with signs around this hospital and oh my gosh, I can't believe this. But I mean, we talk about this, right? Like hair is historic, like culturally, it was an important thing, right? Braiding the hair even. I went to a teaching on braids at um, Telus Spark a couple months ago with a friend of mine. We went um, to talk, like they had elders there talking about braiding and like about sweetgrass and braiding about the hair because sweetgrass is the hair of, you know, the mother earth and like just different things about hair and men particularly in braids and it was interesting you know and it's an ex this is where your spirit resides right is in, in in indigenous culture and this was the first one of the first things they did and then think about it like it's like in the army right what's the first thing they do like my dad was in the army and i have a brother who's it's still in the army first thing they do is they cut your hair and they shave your head right it's to remove your identity you're part of this system now. And so that's kind of the idea that they did, right? Like they did this for everybody, but it was also an affront to indigenous peoples. And I don't know that they understood that. It just happened to be, you know, on their side, a good play because it was a, a definitely a way to do that. Um, talking about health. So this is really important to understand. Um, it is getting better. I have to say under my community in the Métis, especially Manitoba, the health conditions for our people are worse than any other group in Canada right now. Um, First Nations have done a lot to work with their people and, and because now our government in Manitoba has got some clout and actually under working with the federal government is able to fund a lot of things now they're getting to the point where they can do that because we we don't have anything like that because we, we're not under the Indian Act. So Métis and Inuit um, peoples have had to work on that area themselves. Um, but it is hopefully getting better now. But many of these illnesses and conditions, right, they're disproportionate, disproportionately experienced by Indigenous peoples. And that includes obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, right? We have so many people with diabetes that even that are not overweight. I know lots of my friends that have it that are thin people. It's just something that's happened from the way that they've grown up or not having enough to eat, that sort of thing. Um, you know, and a lot of people, cardiovascular disease, a lot. It's actually really scary. How many people I know that have died from heart-related diseases? And again, not necessarily big people, right? Not necessarily the weight issue. It's a lot of trauma and stress and things like that that have affected them. And those are lasting effects of colonialism, right? And um, for First Nations people being on reserves, residential schooling, and then like this, these people have noted that colonialism is, you know, a distal determinant of health. It's a basis of which there's other determinants. And this is across the world, not just in Canada, right? So colonialism, wherever it may be, you look in other countries, like in South America, you look at places in Africa, um, you know, this, these things are very, very apparent um, for looking at indigenous peoples, right? And they may not have access to your kids, may not have access to healthy foods. And this is true, especially right now, I think for a lot of students, I don't think it's just indigenous students because of the economy. So it's pretty scary out there right now, but indigenous kids especially um, tend to not have this access or the education about it, their families don't. And the other part of it I wanna to explain too is, especially in cities, exercise is often not encouraged. I'm not saying it's not encouraged, but outside due to fear of children being taken, especially the girls and then potential racism and bullying when they're playing with other children. So just so you know, and it's not, like I said, it's not every kid, but it tends to be happening. 
So I also want to talk to the effect of non-Indigenous students about this, right? So we have our Indigenous students, these are definitely the things that have happened. But what has also happened because of residential schools and um, being segregated as well. So Indigenous students were segregated generally from um, non-Indigenous students in schools until not that long ago, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years the most. Um, the, these kids are receiving a Eurocentric curriculum and teaching practices as well. So I often talk about, you know, Indigenous assessment, and Indigenous um, ways of knowing and how that would change your teaching practice. I do a lot of that. Um, the other part of it is that socioeconomic conditions are generally better. Not always, I was gonna say that, because um, I know not for every non-Indigenous student life is great, um, but they tend, definitely conditions are generally better. Um, there's also a lack of understanding of the other or for those whose country they live in. And I think that's a really important point for me to make is that this country that we live in is an Indigenous country. And um, like I, the way that I described Métis people, it was a lady actually, you know, that's Métis in, in Edmonton and she described it very well. We are um, post-contact pre-colonial people, which means that we are Indigenous, we are part European, but our sense of the world is definitely from a, an Indigenous perspective as a people. And so we are also part of that. So just so you understand, because people often don't understand about that, the Métis as well. Um, so we are the other, even though people like myself don't appear to be indigenous is what you'd think of how people look. Um, so it, it's really important, I think, that our non-indigenous students start to understand that too. So what does that mean for teachers, right? So I've explained to you, like, here's indigenous kids, there's what they have to deal with, non-indigenous kids, you know, what they've inherited as well in a school system. So I think it's really important. I'm going to give you a scenario that this is from an article that um, I read online. and. Um, so this is the thing, how would you feel if this was happening in your kid's class, right? So last fall, and this is a few years ago, this is from the article, a grade six social studies class outside of Edmonton was learning about residential schools. A student put up her hand and said, I don't have anything against indigenous people, but my grandpa told me we had to put the Indians in residential schools because they were killing each other and we had to civilize them. So just leaving that for a moment to let you sit with that, right? Um, so this is, the article continues, her words hung in the air for a moment, and then her teacher responded, well, I don't have anything against your grandpa, but people who are your grandpa's age and your parents' age and even my age didn't have the opportunity to learn the truth. So we have a responsibility because we're learning the truth now. And I think that's the important piece, right? It's, 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 you can only know what you know. And I think that's important to understand and you're here. And so that is important because you obviously you care. And I, and I hate that idea of whether you're white or not, but that white guilt or the um, settler guilt, guilt that comes along with people, right? Because I don't think that guilt is a positive way to move forward and to enact change, right? Because we can just sit with guilt and we can feel poorly about ourselves and think, oh, like Eeyore, oh darn, I can't change this now, right? But you're here because I think you wanna change that. So I think it's really important to understand that, right? And when we understand better, we do better. And so that's that's an expression we have. A friend of mine always says, like, when people mess up, you always like, do better, right? So that's really what we always say, because we don't really have, and especially in Cree, there's no word for sorry. And there's no word for failure, right? There's only, okay, now you know, so do better. It's like candy, right? So that's what we're talking about for educators. So I want to look at some resources for you guys, um, just to help you do better, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough subject to talk about, but I think if we approach it in that way, if we approach it in that with the kids, you know, let's talk about this is what's happened and, you know, this is what we've got, right? This is what we got to deal with. We can't lie about it anymore. We can't hide it anymore. So how do we make things better? And we teach these kids. These kids are the ones that are going to go forward, right? It's really important. So, you know, talking about, you know, choosing to participate, which you guys have done, and, and the kids in school, well, they kind of have to participate, right? They're in school, and this is what they're learning. Um, but it's important, right, for the individual in the society to connect. And we learn that difference between the we and the they. I even had somebody in our, our First Nations Métis Inuit uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago say, because I put some language in a presentation, I was getting them to give me feedback. And she said, take out the word they. Just take it out, because it make, gives us this uh, us and them. 
right? They and them. We don't want that. And it's like, no, yeah, that's a good point, right? I got to avoid that. That's a good, that's good to know, right? So I'm always learning and re being reminded of these things. How can we bridge that gap and how can we make it so that we're all understanding each other and getting along better? That's what we want. We want understanding, right? When we do that, we can talk about the we and the they, right? And talk, look at real history. We can make judgments and we can talk memories and what is the legacy? What is a legacy? And then we go around again, we choose to participate and we choose to change it. We choose to go forward with understanding. It's really important, right? So anyway, this article's in here, so you guys can look at that. I think it's a really good one, especially for looking at junior high and senior high for kids and what you can do with them in terms of changing attitudes. Um, this is University of Saskatchewan. There's some really good stuff on here. There's a teacher's resource guide. There's a teacher kits, lesson plans, and other resources for all the different grades. So if you see down the left-hand side, they have K to four, five to eight, and nine to 12. And so I decided to live leave this with you guys so you can click on that and look for the different lessons in the kits there's also a number of books on here that they um reference and then just some different websites where you can look for more information and what grades they were at and even even farther over to the left for instance they have you know like it's for websites for like the forgotten metis like i said talking about you know a lot of people don't realize that metis people went to residential schools and then inuit people starting back in the 1950s um, and then looking at that National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and just a whole lot of different um, things. There's a virtual exhibit where the children talking about those who survived and those who didn't. And then BC, I love BC, how they have so many amazing lessons. And I know it doesn't always line up with our curriculum, but you can always great, get great ideas. Um, there's a definitely a grade nine lesson on here for residential schools, but you'll see that there are lots of different ones on here if you wanna search and they're really great because they always do the introduction, pre-assessment, all that kind of stuff, post-assessment, extension activities, lots of different stuff in there in BC. And then there's a Simon Fraser University due to a lot of the, obviously the, the name even of the university has taken a lot of flack because of the individual who's it's named after, but they are really working really hard on reconciliation, which is important, right? And that's the main thing. Um, what do we learn from this? So that's what they're doing. And this is talk, talking about using um, the 94 calls to action. And again, tons of links about um, residential schools and then things that you can do in the classroom. Um, yeah, and then supports. And of course, you know, because it is a very sensitive issue. And, and I always say to educators too, be mindful of who's in your classroom, right? I mean, especially if you have Indigenous students, um, be careful. And they may not even want to participate in some of this because they've had to live it. So, you know, always be mindful of that. Or other kids that just have, like, that have severe trauma. Like, we have kids that are refugees. We have kids that have grown up with, you know, and they have post-traumatic stress syndrome from things that they've gone through. So I always suggest before you approach these subjects, especially if you're going to get into a day where you're talking about some of the abuses that went on, um, not that you have to go over it in detail, but just even mentioning them can trigger kids, especially, you know, um, just be mindful of that and be careful about what you're sharing and who you're sharing it with. I think that's really important to understand. We don't want to re-traumatize people at all. It's really important. Um, but there's some resources here on the First Nation. Uh, this is, um, yeah, it's our time education toolkit on the um, Assembly of First Nations website. And they have lots of really great resources, but you'll notice here they've got like a user guide. They've got books, they go to the TRC, they've got stories of residential school survivors, the apology, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is so important. So UNDRIP is super important for people to understand as well if you don't, if you haven't looked at that. And then um, this is a YouTube video and I'm not gonna show it to you, but I just wanna um, point it out to you. Oh shoot, it's gonna try to I don't really want an ad, but anyways, I'll just refer to it for you because I don't wanna go through the ad on here, go through that but it's how to talk about residential schools to kids. And it's a video for teachers and parents. So I thought that would be a useful resource because this can be, like I said, such a sensitive subject. Um, I do wanna look at those pedagogical considerations and I do have UNDRIP in here so we can look at that for just a second. This is University of Windsor and there's actually a document in here, a PDF that I thought um, I would include for you. So it is pedagogical considerations for teaching about residential schools. And of course this starts with Orange Shirt Day. And the thing is, I always say too, um, September 30th, it's a great way um, to get this information out there, but it's not a day that we do this and forget. It should be the starting point for these discussions and it should be the starting point to 
talking to kids about some of these issues again but how do we do that right and like I said we don't want to re-traumatize people and so that's the first thing they start with right is know the learner right um that's really important to really do that and um again to you you have people who have self-identified in your classrooms that are indigenous but you have many that may not have particularly that are metis Uh, there are still many people in my community and where i came from even that um will not talk about it my mother is in her late 70s and, and i have to say aside from praying for healing for my family for all the intergenerational trauma um she started to talk about it but i also think it's because i am reclaiming my family's history and being proud of who i am and not something she or my aunt could ever do growing up particularly my mother being the eldest and um felt very embarrassed because that's what they were taught that's what i was taught so you may have people in your classes that are still like that and parents that don't want to talk about it so that might even be tough you might not know sometimes unfortunately um so i don't sure what you can do about that you know people don't want to talk about it um but really important right to really focus on indigenous voices about that make those connections to colonialism it's really important to understand that like i don't think that you should be blaming like I, ha- I remember even talking to my chiropractor one day and, and he said something about, um, cause you know, he's white and he's male and he said, said something to me about, um, it's all white male, <laughs> middle-class, I don't even know how he said it, but it was something about basically white men. And I looked at him and I said, I think that's an oversimplification and a generalization. I said, I, I don't blame everything on white men. I said, you know, it's, it goes back to colonialism and, it, and was that generally white men? Yeah, but it was also like Queen Victoria was not a man and, um, you know, like a lot of these issues. And I think that we have to stay away from blaming that We have to because that's not entirely true, right? It's, it's that whole system. It's a whole system of government and a whole thinking. I often say my grandmother, because my grandpa married a woman who, whose family was English, she was half Swedish, but didn't know her dad. And, um, sometimes the things she would say and I would just look at her I go Nana why would you say that but her behavior was so different she wouldn't ever treat anybody poorly but sometimes the things she said I was like yeah no problem sorry thanks Tanya um we're almost done anyways I'm just gonna do some questions at the end but yeah I just I think it's really important right to talk about that focus on that that colonial piece and not that we separate it from today but I don't blame people today you know um unless they're going on and being ignorant about things like that's the thing. And then just talking about that moving to action, right? That's really important. And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. We can be gentle with ourselves. We don't have to take on all that guilt. Like I said, I don't think it's a yeah, positive thing ever. So this is, and that's, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Um, this is the United Nations Declaration uh, So under, for kids, so like youth. So this is, it's written in youthful language so they can understand it. So I, I included this document so that you can use it with kids because I think um, obviously high school, you know, grade 11, grade 12, if they're in those higher level courses, they can understand it. But this is written in simpler language for kids to understand. And so you can look at some of these things that are tied to the call to action for Canada. It's important. And then I have some other resources. I don't have time to go through every single one of them. Well, I'm a couple of minutes before I want to do like some talking with you guys, if you have questions and things like that. Um, but, you know, we can look at a couple. Like This is from Manitoba, which of course, is where I come from. There's lots of resources there because we have lots of stuff for First Nations and um, Métis people, particularly for residential schools. And because we do have um, that Center for Truth and Reconciliation there, but lots of links to books, uh, you know, personal experiences, memoirs, lots of information there, talking about, you know, um, education resources, websites, so tons of stuff on here, lots of different things and links to movies and things and all the age difference that are appropriate. Um, we do also have from uh, FNESC, which is a great website, um, lots of stuff in here all the time, but they've got lots of resources here too as well for some different grades. There's a video overview of what that looks like. So there's some things on there. And UBC, of course, always has really great stuff. And that's what I found. I don't think I found this video on there, but they do have a link to that. 
um, right, the pathway to reconciliation. They've got the witness blanket talking about that and just a whole bunch of other links for things that you can look at in regards to. And again, like I said, original, Aboriginal people, resilience in the residential school legacy, right? Resilient people. And I think we need to focus on that, how strong Indigenous people are instead of trying to make us look like we're all weak and, and suffering and, right, where everybody's working together to try to get healthy and get better. So that's the important thing to focus on. Um, you, University of Alberta has an awesome website here, right? And they've got tons of stuff on their library site. If you haven't seen it for lesson planning um, for residential schools, there's tons of stuff here as well. And you'll see some things are, you know, re a repetition of um, things that are in the Manitoba website because they're all really good. So there's that. Yeah, so there's lots of resources for you guys. And then we're done. So I'm going to stop share with this. And then I'm going to stop record.